Well, good morning to Mr. Raleigh and Mr. Raleigh and Mr. Raleigh and Mr. Raleigh. Mr. Raleigh. And uh, one without the mustache, Mr. Raleigh. <laughs> Good to have all the Raleigh's here. <laughs> well, what do you think of these sons of Korda? Some rich stuff, isn't it? We've only looked at Psalm 42, 43, and a bit of 84, and there's 10 others, 12 altogether. Today we're going to continue on with uh, Psalm 84 and conclude with a few really vital points for all of us to think about truth as we want to be honest uh, with God. So let's uh, read this text once more together and I'm going to invite you to stand in honor of God's word and we'll read it in unison as we've been doing to embed it in our hearts, our spirits. Psalm 84, for the choir director on the Gittith a psalm of the sons of Korah. How lovely are your dwelling places, O Lord of hosts! My soul longed and even yearned for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. The bird also has found a house, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. How blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Selah. How blessed is the man whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. Passing through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The early rain also covers it with blessings. They go from strength to strength. Every one of them appears before God in Zion. O Lord, God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Selah. Behold our shield, O God, and look upon the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand outside. I would rather stand at the threshold of the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord gives grace and glory. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, how blessed is the man who trusts in you. You can be seated. Thank you so much. <clears throat> You will uh, remember, I hope, that yesterday we explained how this, another of the Psalms of the Sons of Korah, is actually quite uh, simple in its structure, although it's profound and deep and complicated in theology. Its structure is built around really simply two vocatives and a prayer at the end to conclude the psalm. And you remember that we learned that a vocative is a declarative exclamation, very important in Hebrew grammar, as in how lovely in verse 1 and how blessed in verse 5. Two vocative declarative exclamations. Also yesterday I suggested that the first vocative is essentially offering a comparison assessing good worship as opposed to mediocre worship or even poor worship or bad worship. As focused we saw yesterday on the living God, the God of life. But this first vocative goes on with even more to say with reference to a qualitative comparison defining what is good worship. It goes on, for example, not only to encourage our focus on the living God in verse 2, the God of life, 
But such worship is also assessed according to how it advances a focus on God who is the king of your life. Do you see that in verse 3? The bird also has found a house and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young, even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my king and my God. And note the grammar of Hebrew is very important, the order there, first my king declarative and my God. It is obviously psalmic language that has in view a necessary and healthy awareness of the kingdom of God that was so much at the heart of Jesus' ministry and message. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. The gospel, Jesus said, of the kingdom. At the heart of kingdom of God theology is, of course, a relational posture, <clears throat> a posture relationally that acknowledges, yes, God is friend. Yes, God is helper. Yes, God is the rock of my life. Yes, God is comforter, but overarching it all and superseding all of it is God, in the Hebrew thinking, is king. King of the universe, the king who's enthroned in the temple, the king who is king of my life. Malki ve Elochao. Malki, my king, it says first, Elohau, the Elohau, and my God. And for the sons of Korah, no doubt, this kingdom language would not only have invoked a relational posture toward God as king, but even, yes, a good Hebrew worshiper would understand a physical posture before a king in the presence of the ultimate king. And do you know, can you guess what that posture would be? The Levitical priests of Israel and all evidence suggests that especially so for these sons of Korah actually demonstrated their worshiping hearts by falling prostrate in the temple before God, flat on your face. A posture that acknowledges the king. A means of saying, I believe this is the king. I was so deeply moved last night with incredible music from Anne and Bethany and Ben. And their postures of deep involvement, deep awareness, deep experience with what a composer has put in their own interpretation of that posture for Hebrews. Bodily expression was so important. We in the West think it's all up here, but the Hebrews said it's got to come out <laughs> in the posture of your body and expressly so prostrate, flat on your face. For the Levitical musician priests, this was not at all a posture synonymous with abjection of, you know, poverty of spirit, but rather it was a posture of joyous submission 
to the benevolent, the good, the gracious king of the universe, God. And so we can and should sing as Charles Wesley offers us, Rejoice, the Lord is king, your Lord and king, adore. I, uh, let's sing it right now, would you, with me? Just, just from your head and your heart, an a cappella. Rejoice, the Lord is king, your Lord and king adore. Rejoice, give thanks and sing and triumph evermore. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say rejoice. Joyous submission, prostrate, not with abjection, but rejoicing. Because this king is benevolent, this king is good, this king is full of grace and mercy. And so the sons of Korah would ask you this morning, this our last day, for me that's very emotional because I, I depart on Sunday and I, I want to see my wife and... <laughs> and other children and go back to these refugees and their issues. But I don't want to leave you all. It's just too rich, too good. This our last day. I have to ask you what the sons of Korah would put before you. What is your relational posture in your life in reference to God? Yes, of course, he's your friend. He's your rock. He's your helper, he's your comforter, but superseding it all in Hebrew idea, he is your king, your king. And what is the physical posture of your life, your body expression in reference to God? Can you sing with the sons of Korah and with my namesake, Charles Wesley or John, either one? my king, my God. Kingdom of God is at hand. Kingdom of God is within you. Kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. Kingdom of God is like a precious coin that the widow loses and spends days cleaning her house to find. The kingdom of God is like that treasure in a field that the person sells everything to retrieve it because God is king. Good worship, sons of Korda are teaching us in this psalm. Good worship qualitatively assessed leads you to joyous prostration, flat on your face because it reminds you, good worship reminds you God is king of the universe. As we sing in that incredible Celtic hymn, Be Thou My Vision, High King of Heaven, my victory won, still be my vision, O ruler, kingdom language, ruler of all. Now, <clears throat> there's still more from this psalm that we could say about just this first vocative, quite a few other things actually, but because of time, I'm going to move on now to the second vocative in verse 5, so then that we have at least a wee bit of opportunity to look at the closing prayer in the psalm that concludes it. The second vocative in verse 5 focuses on the blessed person. How blessed is the man? 
Thus, the logic of this Psalter psalm is, as worship is obviously or should be God-oriented, then it is not out of order that the second vocative is oriented human word. How blessed is the man. But, of course, derivative of qualitatively good worship. One of the premier Old Testament scholars of our day, Walter Brueggemann, who teaches down, well, he's retired now, but taught for many years in Columbia, Georgia, uh, where our friends are from, I think, or near there. Um, Walter Brueggemann is considered to just be a, the guru of Old Testament theology understands the Psalms to be consistently speaking to the human phenomenon which is experienced as beginning with orientation, moving into times of disorientation. Anybody been there? And then moving into reorientation. And worship, of course, when it is healthy, is all about reorientation, isn't it? Because it is about revisiting reality via the light and truth of the King of God. And here it is particularly drawing attention to the blessed person who is here defined as the strong person person because worship has had its effect and thus their strength comes from God. Verse 5, how blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, in you. And naturally it cannot help but raise the question, even as you go through this day, where do you derive strength? Where does your strength come from? Good quality worship. If we have worshipped at all well, even this morning, it should reorient you away from self-centeredness, away from self-dependence, and toward a renewal of your dependence upon the King, God, who is the only reliable, lasting source of strength. But here in this second vocative, in verse 5, we find a clear example. I'm going to have to be a little bit technical here, so bear with me. Uh, but it's very important, and I think I can explain it to you. We find a clear example of what is called Hebrew parallelism. And this is a poetic device all through the Psalms, but particularly the sons of Korah love them, in which, grammatically, the second phrase, very simple really, the second phrase in a pair of statements further defines or explicates the first phrase. So here we have in verse 5, how blessed is the man whose strength is in you, parallelism. Here's how you explain that, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. It's a poetic metaphor. Misaloth beluvavam. In the heart, highways. To Zion, a poetic metaphor that is depicting in Hebrew poetry a grand, deliberate, freely used, well used access to God via the heart. Hebrews, Israeli people had much more to say about the heart than they did the brain. Isn't that interesting? Now I think the brain's important. <laughs> but as it's fed by the heart, 
That's what Wilmus Chey would tell you. Let it come from your heart, through your brain, through your body, through your mouth, through your fingers. But Hebrews says it starts in the heart. So it cannot help but again raise the personal question, not only what is your relational posture towards God, not only what is your physical posture towards God, but what is your heart connection to God? Not just your outward behavior, which can easily be pretended, can easily even be performative. You all are learning performance. And that's a good thing except when it masks the truth. I know that many people come to Chehi Summer School of Music and where they're at with God is kind of a pretend thing, a performative thing that you've learned in church. Sons of Korda would say, what about the heart connection? Do you have this deliberate, grand, freely used, well used access to God, a highway from the heart? And finally, this prayer concludes, as we said, with a, or this psalm concludes with a prayer that we read in the final verses, and we're going to give just a few minutes of attention to verses 8 to 12. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Selah. Behold our shield, our God, our, O God, and look upon the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand outside. I would rather stand at the threshold of the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord gives grace and glory. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly, or that can be translated, who walk with integrity. O oh, Lord of hosts, how blessed is the man who trusts in you. And in good Hebrew tradition, and particularly as pertains again to the Levitical purposes of these sons of Korah, this is what the rabbis referred to as a teaching prayer. So that it ought not to surprise us that it moves back and forth from addressing God himself to instructing us about God himself. Because of our time limits, I'm only going to conclude with one key truth that this teaching prayer offers us, but it offers us five or six. The one key truth I want to conclude with and bring to your attention we find in verse 11 where the prayer teaches us about the grace and the glory which bespeak the character of God. Look at verse 11, either in your own Bible or on the screen. The Lord gives grace and glory. No good thing. No good thing. Thing does he withhold from those who walk in integrity? This too is the sons of Korah at their best with their love of Hebrew parallelism, so that the second phrase once again defines and explicates the first, so that what it is teaching is a hugely important theological truth. How does God's grace and glory display itself in your life? The second phrase explains it. No 
good thing does he withhold from those of integrity? No good thing expresses the glory and the grace of God. The theological parameter of this teaching, however, is the important part, isn't it? The theological frame. For who determines what is the good thing for you? The subject of the parallel phrase is also the determiner. God alone knows what is the most helpful, the right thing, the best, the good for you. And on that basis, he will not withhold anything that he determines, not you, not your parents, not your dreams, that he determines is the good thing as an expression of his grace, his glory even. Do you believe that? Do you believe that no good thing God will withhold from you if you're walking in integrity? Do you trust that? This concluding prayer from the sons of Korah teaches you that you can absolutely trust this truth about God. Which is why the psalm ends, how blessed is the man who trusts in you. Do you believe it? Do you trust it? Will you trust it two months from now when it seems like there is no good thing? Will you believe it when your dreams kind of are challenged or even shattered? Will you trust it even when it gets really, really difficult? No good thing will he withhold from those who walk in integrity in Psalm concludes with that challenge. Blessed is the one who trusts. So my prayer for each of you this year at the Chehi Summer, Summer School of Music, I really hope and pray you advance musically. I hope you have a great time and your relationships grow and I hope you're time with your counselors is incredibly potent and rich and your time under teacher's tutelage and your dreams of musical progress. But more than anything, I pray that you learn to trust God, trust him. His expression of his glory and his grace is that he will not withhold any good thing from you if you walk with integrity. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for the sons of Korah, for who they are, their passions, their music, their words, their theology, their wisdom, their honesty. I pray that you would allow me to trust you more today. Pray that you'd allow these students and teachers and counselors and staff to trust you. And we rely on this truth. You will not withhold any good thing if I walk with integrity today. In the name of Jesus, amen. I have today and tomorrow, and I'd be so thrilled to chat with you. If any of you want to meet up, just 
buy me a cup of coffee. <laughs> and we'll talk away and pray and really bless each other. Okay? If that would be helpful, please seek me out. <laughs>